Okay, uh, so just let me, um, my name is Mahmoud Moshi Rahman. I'm going to chair this session. And I know you are aware about the, uh, about the uh, rules and regulation, whatever it is, but let me just uh, very briefly read it out. I mean, it's just uh, on the, uh, I mean, we need to keep uh, the time. Uh, I mean, uh, that's the only thing we need to look at. Uh, so uh, I, as you know, uh, this session is uh, almost, 50 minutes long. So, uh, and we'll be having four papers in this session. And I'm delighted uh, to see the papers, the abstract. So uh, I'm really, we are looking forward to it. And uh, then each paper presenter will have um, uh, 10 minutes to present. And then, and at the end of this session, we'll be uh, having a question and answer session. So uh, if you have any question or query, just uh, wait for the end of the session and then this, uh, you, can, you can have time to ask them to, directly to the presenters, all right? So um, uh, let me welcome our first uh, presenter who is um, uh, uh, Mr. Kazi uh, Arko Rahman. Uh, um, from uh, West Virginia University, USA. Uh, Mr. Arko, are you ready? Yeah, I can go now. Uh, yes, all right. If you need any support, just just uh, let us know, all right? Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Yes. All right, uh, thank you for the floor. Uh, my name is Kazi Arko Rahman, as I've been already introduced. Let me just uh, apologize at the beginning. It's 1 a.m. here in my place, the United States. Uh, this is my seventh hour running speaking. So if my voice is a little bit cracked, I apologize in advance. Uh, the title of my paper is Why Know It All? Politics of the Land and Its Representation in Zia, that's in the light of what we know. I would, uh, as my abstract has suggested, I kind of look into this novel as an what Benjamin Barthes has mentioned as in like writing back to the encyclopedic genre of the Western canon and the criticism that this particular novel has received, which I argue is partly because of the writer's South Asian origin. The problem that this novel has regarding its representation or continuing the perpetual stereotype that we have of Afghanistan in general. I would like to start this presentation with this particular short story. This is one of my favorite one. I'd like to plug it in in everywhere, but after reading this novel, I basically thought that this goes really well with this particular book's theme. This is a one paragraph short story by On Exactitude in Science by Jorge Luis Borges. And I would like to read it out before we move into my presentation in general. In that empire, the art of cartography attained such perfection that the map of a single province occupied the entirety of a city and the map of the empire, the entirety of a province. In time, those unconscionable maps no longer satisfied, and the cartographer's guide struck a map of the empire whose size was that of the empire, and which coincided point for point with it. The following generation, who were not so fond of the study of cartography as their forebears had been, saw that the first map was useless, and not without some pitilessness was it that they delivered it up to the inclement of sun and winters in the desert of the West still today, there are tattered ruins of that map inhabited by animals and beggars. In all the land there is no other relic of the discipline of geography. Now this Borges story like created fictionally as a quotation from Suarez Mendia, imagine an empire where the science of cartography becomes so exact that the only map on the scale sorry, so it's exact that only a map on the same scale as the empire itself will suffice, a map which will be by point on point to the exact empire and whole. Bothered outside this short story as like one of the finest, finest allegory of simulation, describing how it aging double ends up being confused with the real thing, covering the very thing that it was meant to represent. He also considered this short story as the ultimate form or symmetry concept of the hyper real. This goes very well with the protagonist of this novel, Zafor, and his claims that metaphors never tell you what exactly happened, and I quote, how it happened or why it happened. 
but that they highlight their own idacus and the truths that exist beyond them. Same with MAP, and I think vis-a-vis -vis our popular imagination of what exactly is Afghanistan, which has been considered where empires go to end up in ruin. The map of Afghanistan, the representation of Afghanistan, be it constructed by language, media, or literature, as we are seeing in this particular presentation, the question remains, what is our understanding of Kabul or in extension Afghanistan in general? What exactly is this understanding from point to point and can it be considered as a complete whole like the map in this side short story? Does our understanding of Afghanistan develop from travelogue or any other kind of text from NGO reports, from CNN news, from BBC? How exactly do we know this country which had been in a perpetual turmoil for a long time? And how does Zia Aydar's novel come into play in this regard? Which brings us to this question that these novels deal with in the light of what Nuno as a brief summary. This novel is a very overambitious, erudite and uh, encyclopedic to say the least. It has almost an ashamed, unashamed varieties of a first branches of knowledge. Its characters talk mostly brilliantly about uh, uh, topics starting from philosophy, mathematics, exile and immigration, warfare, Wall Street, financial trading, uh, contemporary geopolitics, and it ranges across Bangladesh, Pakistan, Afghanistan, English high society, American Ivy League schools, Islamic terrorism, uh, Western paternalism, and whatnot. Mostly presented as a series of dialogue or conversation between Zafar and Zafar, who is a Bangladeshi-born Oxford educated polymath, and this unnamed narrator, who is an old wealthy Pakistani American and one time classmate of Zafar, the novel offers an encyclopedic anatomy of words knowledge. And really, the grasp on that is like it's uh, surprising to see the list. Now, Zafar and this narrator discuss everything from finance to history to mathematics to cartography to bring to sweep in the light. In fact, that initially appears a view poured by Italy Calvino regarding the purpose of literature. Which, and this appears as one of the epigraphs in the novel itself. And the epigraph goes like this. Overambitious projects may be objectionable in many fields, but not in literature. The grand challenge for literature is to be capable of weaving together the various branches of knowledge the into, a manifold, into a manifold of, sorry, <clears throat> manifold of multifaceted version of the world. But one have to wonder how exactly like this or where exactly this project of overambition translate regarding real life or in other arenas. Because in many cases, literary overambition can be translated into problematic things. Edward Mendelssohn was the first one who popularized the term encyclopedic, encyclopedic narrative in 1976, associated primarily with the giants of the Western canon. Sorry, uh, Gautier, Cervantes, Joyce, and American, if you consider like Melville, Pynchon, Wallace, and uh, people who come afterwards. Encyclopedism, this particular term, as Stephen Ercolino argues, is response to the desire to capture the world in one full soup. It gives body to the overwhelming desire for a conceptual mastery of reality, which grows even stronger and ever more impossible to the same degree that reality grows more complex, unquote. Now the lexicon of encyclopedism, like all this capturing the world, being the master of one's fate and overwhelming desire, mastering the reality in general, echoes the lexicon of colonialism. And this is almost fairly obvious. The colonizer's ability to capture the resources of the world was based on an overwhelming desire to have a mastery of the real world. Indeed, since physical and conceptual mastery were reciprocal throughout the colonial world, one might argue that the encyclopedist accumulation of knowledge was not merely homologous with the colonialist acquisition of territory, but surely integral of it. We can also find the same kind of evidence in Edward Said's Orientalism, uh, who says, and I quote, modern Orientalism embodies a systematic discipline of accumulation and far from being exclusively an intellectual or theoretical feature, it made Orientalism fatally tend towards systematic accumulation of human beings and territories, again, having a map and owning a map from point to point regarding everything that we have on it. Since Mendelssohn popularized the time and secondary narrative in a pair of influential essays somewhere around 1976, attempts to determine the exact purpose of incorporating encyclopedism into narrative have tended to move into either one of two directions. 
The encyclopedia works strive to create a total and complete portrait of society as an attempt has been done in this particular novel, or alternatively that they set out to question and critique the ideological presumption such, such an effort. For critics such as Mendelssohn and like Franco Murphy in general, encyclopedic narrative are something like modern epics. Benjamin Barthes said in this regard, like in question to like encyclopedic narratives and considering this particular novel as a kind of post-colonial encyclopedism to counter the Western canon, suggests that by grounding his character's pursuit of knowledge in a post-colonial history that simultaneously shapes and circum circumcises that pursuit, Rahman's post-colonial encyclopedism, as I shall call it, this is his term, suggests that encyclopedism may be an empowering, if ambivalent, mode of inquiry for post-colonial characters and authors alike. Now, Zia Haider writing this novel is just not a post-colonial writer writing back at something that can be argued as a Western genre, which is the encyclopedic narrative. But it is a necessary thing to do as a South Asian author in this particular age. But it does come with its own problem. Somehow there was a title here, which is not appearing, just said like creating Kabul. Yeah, there it is. Uh, the novel, when it came out, it received rave reviews. James Wood wrote a 4,000 piece, uh, 4,000 word piece in New York Times. And one of the lines which really caught my was that he suggests that it is a novel that displays a formidable familiarity with elite knowledge and takes for granted a capacity for both abstract and worldly thinking. It is in this arena of what is considered as elite and what is considered as not and who exactly is considered as a surprising candidate to be a forebear of elite knowledge that our understanding of globalization and representation of Afghanistan comes into play. The twin legacies of colonialism and class that shaped Jafar, uh, the character in this novel, and his participation in the world of ideas, they also shaped the ideas themselves. They puts the post-colonial subject pursuing knowledge in a very paradoxical position. And we have been all being introduced to the idea of the post-colonial subject. In the novel, the colonial mustaq in Pakistan argues that our elites, and I quote, our elites study at their universities in their language. Do you know what I studied at Oxford? History. But whose bloody history? Theirs. We brought their values wholesale in exchange for our dignity, grafted their subject ruler mentality onto our own, so that these countries of ours are incapable of anything like democracy. We mimic the Westerners, though we hate them. The colonial's commentary amounts to a checklist of the paradoxes of post-colonialism in general, beginning and ending with mimicry. He also highlights the problem of language, the colonization of the mind, and the dangers of the core of nationalism. It is one of the arguments that can be made to ask why Afghanistan is often reduced to just Kabul or Kandahar. The novel takes on the genre, but as far as its representation of the place go regarding where empires go to die, it kind of has the same, uh, it kind of belongs in the same stereotypical consideration that pop culture or Hollywood movies or other piece of pop literature that show Afghanistan as a place of exotic mystic, all the thing of like everything that Orientalism has said, like to the core, it kind of attains to that. While James Sood surprised that even though Zia Haider is an elite league school grad who's an investment banker and has a very prolific CV, but he's surprised regarding he possesses this mastery of elite knowledge, the knowledge that, of the, uh, according to him, hovers in Ivy Leagues, shows, for example, the challenges South Asian writers or writers who are not from the center of the global north faces regarding their portrayal. It is not enough that they have the language or linguistic mastery to write uh, a fiction. Two more minutes. Yep. Two more minutes. Or, two, two more minutes. Two more minutes. Uh, yeah. Two. All right. Yeah, I'll be done. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, even when he does so, like even uh, if he does so, like he is still put under suspicion. On the other hand, uh, Zihadar's portrait for Afghanistan ranges for the stereotypical in general. We have the NGOs, we have the secret societies, we have people named Sulaiman. We have even a French. Uh, top dog who is accused of adultery, as stereotypical as it goes. So while the argument is, and this is the last slide, this is the current map. If you search for map of Afghanistan, this would be the one of the top three searches. And this is basically a map that is not of Afghanistan, but in popular representation, 
an map of an area that is either government controlled or in popular term free or basically Taliban controlled. So while Ziyadar's novel is fighting against being a South Asian writer, fighting against the center, being having mastery and still being doubted, but his own representation of Afghanistan or Kabul in general contributes to this particular idea of Afghanistan where it is either Taliban or the freedom and nothing in between. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Uh, Kazi Yorku Rahman for your in-depth uh, presentation. Uh, now I would uh, like to um, welcome our next presenter, uh, Dr. Um, Dr. Sanjay Malik uh, from University of Badwan, India. And um, uh, his title of presentation is Reconfiguring Rabindranath Tagore's Kabliwala in Zihada Hinas, Kumkum mm -hmm. is doing fine. All right, uh, Dr. Dr. Malik, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my paper. Uh, the title of my paper is uh, Reconfiguring Rabindranath Tagore's Kabuliola in Jayadahina's uh, Kumkum is doing fine. Uh, Jayadahina is a Urdu writer from uh, Pakistan. Uh, she writes this uh, short story uh, in Urdu and this short story uh, is translated into English by uh, Yusuf Sahid. Uh, Jahida Hina uh, actually has uh, written this short story against uh, the backdrop of the American bombings in Afghanistan. In fact, uh, in the wake of the 9-11 terrorist attacks, uh, America carried out its uh, war on terror largely in Afghanistan and went on bombing uh, Kabul, thereby killing uh, many innocent civilians and leaving many others in death in life existence. Uh, the entire Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan virtually became the war theater of USA. So however, uh, in this paper, I have uh, attempted to uh, critically examine uh, how this short story, uh, Kumkum is doing fine, uh, has been a wonderful appropriation of Tegar's Kabuliola. Uh, I would also like to examine how uh, Kumkum, the narrator, claims herself as a repository uh, of the history of the Rehmat Kabuliwalas. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, as far as Tegar's uh, Kabuliwala is concerned, uh, Tegar actually has uh, you know, confined uh, you know, her short story to two generations. Uh, Jahidahina has extended uh, Tegar's story to two more generations. Uh, she has uh, told us of what has uh, perhaps happened to uh, Kabuliwala's daughter and her grandchildren. Uh, we find uh, Tegor's mini in the form of Dadima, the narrator's uh, grandmother. Uh, in the story, uh, which is written in an epistolary form, the narrator Kumkum, uh, who is an uh, Indian Bengali doctor, uh, she has been very much you know, inspired by uh, her grandmother's real life story uh, about her father figure, Rahmat Kabulola and his daughter. Uh, from her grandmother, she has heard of the friendly relations between Kabuliola and her dadima, who was then a little girl. Uh, she has heard of Kabuliola, Kabuliola's uh, fatherly affection uh, for uh, her dadima. Uh, this affection transcends uh, the boundaries of race, religion, or nationality. And that uh, fatherly affection uh, you know, came out uh, uh, in a big way uh, in his act of you know, meeting her on the day of, you know, Dadima's marriage. Uh, and this, you know, Kabuliola actually came to uh, meet her uh, on her, you know, wedding day uh, with Amuns after her, after his release of, you know, from uh, eight years in prison. Uh, all this actually uh, inspired, you know, this narrator, you know, Kumkum uh, to devote herself to uh, rendering her service uh, to the wounded in Afghanistan. And Kumkum Kum obviously has uh, gone there as a doctor. Uh, she has a soft corner for the Kabuliolas. Uh, going there, you know, she actually has, uh, you know, hoped in vain to come across uh, Dadima's childhood hero, uh, his daughter and his daughter's children, grandchildren, 
but the kabuliwalas are uh, in terrible crisis because of the american attacks in the letter that you know she actually writes to her uh, grandmother uh, in the letter she recounts her experience of the shadows of death on the walls of each house and lines of blood in each street and bazaar of kabul and uh, she expresses her apprehension that uh, rahmat kabuliwala's daughter and her children and grandchildren must have perished in the american bombings and landmine explosions uh, she says uh, in her letter did i come across your childhood hero in the streets of kabul i didn't meet even his daughter his granddaughters now how how could i have uh, made them when they must have perished in the cellars of their homes see for the rights nowadays where i am living is the war theater of usa see for the says jenghis khan's army annihilated the population of bamiyan but today's jenghis jenghis do not live like dracula they stick their teeth in the necks of nations and keep on sucking their blood their war planes drop death with water packets and biscuits with landmines so one day uh, unquote one day uh, terribly uh, you know exhausted you know this uh, you know kumkum the narrator when uh, she was heading uh, you know for the tent to take some rest uh, she saw a young boy reclining by the tent and this young boy was actually uh, you know shot at by the american you know bullets when uh, uh, she saw her uh this this uh, young man you know who was shot at by the american bullets you know this young man when uh, he saw her uh, he uh, stood up and gave her some almonds raisins and walnuts uh here in him in this young man kumkum envisioned the figure of rahmat kabuliwala in a flash i quote in a flash the boy's face transformed he took something out of the sack lying near his feet and extended it towards me i looked at his hand it was full of almonds raisins and walnuts he was calling you i swear by god that that was rahmat baba in the light of january moon tears came to my eyes unquote so obviously um, you know this narrator kumkum you know she had a feeling that rahmat kabulola has not died in each and every generation the rahmat kabuliwalas are there who are the prototypes of love and affection transcending the borders of race religion or nationality even in the face of a uh, terrible crisis so kumkum after that you know she has you know stitched the wounds of this young man she further writes you know to her grandmother uh, that when he was living this young man was living Uh, his eyes were those of a defeated tribe and those eyes headed towards the blind caves of isolation and history uh here uh kumkum you know see for the rights in that moment uh time rushed past me my age fast forwarded now i am a thousand years old perhaps 2000 years unquote so here uh this uh narrator kumkum she claims herself as a repository of the history of the rahmat kabuliwalas and such defeated lots so in this short story uh, jahida hina you know she actually has shown that innocent kabuliwalas the civilians you know they have suffered at the hands of various rulers and when they suffered uh, at the hands of you know the americans you know they you know suffered you know terribly and here jahida you know you know she actually you know raises you know this particular question uh, why should why should uh, the innocent afghanistanis be victimized by suspecting them as terrorists her point is uh, why should you know they be uh, associated with you know the uh, terrorists you know who actually uh, perpetrated the 911 attacks uh, while you know the reputation of you know this this uh afghanistan is uh, is such that you know they are you know big hearted so here jahida hina you know she has you know called into question the aggressive you know uh, foreign policies of america and she has at the same time you know she has expressed a kind of you know sympathy for the kabuliwalas for the afghanistanis you know innocent afghanistanis 
and in uh, the process, you know, she has obviously, you know, upheld, uh, you know, the uh, the uh, prototype, uh, prototypical figure of, you know, such, uh, you know, Afghanistan is. Dr. Malik, uh, you have two more minutes. Uh, okay, two within more. one minute, I'm, I'm finished. Okay, no problem. Thank you. Okay. And uh, on the whole, it could be said that, you know, this uh, short story, uh, Kum Kum is doing fine. Uh, it's a wonderful appropriation uh, because uh, the writer, you know, Jahida Hina, you know, she actually has, uh, you know, uh, uh, extended, you know, the uh, story of Rabindranath Chagor, you know, she has actually taken it to, you know, two more generations. That means, you know, altogether, you know, she actually, you know, talks about, you know, four generations. And not only that, you know, in this short story, uh, it could be said that, you know, the short story is, you know, very much, you know, layered. And that's why, you know, this short story, uh, obviously, you know, attracts our attention and this short story, uh, obviously, you know, invites our, you know, critical, you know, intervention. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Sanjay Malik for your in-depth analysis. Uh, now I would like to welcome our next uh, presenter, uh, Mr. Zahidul Islam from Defodil International University. And uh, the title of his uh, presentation is Revisiting Afghanistan in, in the light of what we know. Mr. Zahid? Yes, I'm here. Yes. And I hope I'm audible. Uh, yes, Am you I audible? are audible. Yeah, you are. Um, if you want to share something, I mean, the screen, you may or uh, you just can Yes, I want to share my screen here. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I'm like Mr. Orko and Dr. Sanjay Malik, I'll be focusing on in the light of what we know, not in, in very in depth, but I'll be looking at the political aspects and the uh, social aspects as represented in the light of what we know by Zia Haider Rahman. So let us first of all uh, go back to the backgrounds of this novel. The novel was published in 2004. It's set mostly during the American war on terror, as we call it, in Afghanistan and the world economic recessions in 2008. The storyline travels from London to Princeton via New York, Dhaka, Islamabad, and Oxford, and surprisingly not India, but it is tough to understand, understand it in the first reading. Um, as it's a very long novel, with 512 page. And also there are some um, observers who believe that the book challenges any attempted summary. So still I'm reading and I'll, I'll be very glad if you uh, have any recommendations on my understanding of the novel. Uh, anyway, so this post 9-11 era novel illustrates Afghanistan, which is apparently scratched and skinned by war. So in the backdrop there are war and people are suffering, but in the forefront, we see that there are so many NGOs and advisors doing their works in Afghanistan. So immediately after the publication, the novel was acclaimed by many and it was also translated later on by in Czech, Greek and Arabic. So these long novel, narrative novel of course, includes almost everything, love, belonging, history, war, and of course our incompleteness of knowledge, anything in particular. Um, uh, this is probably in Salman Rushdie's case, we call the everything novel. So it includes almost everything. Now, come back to the basic discussions. So the fall of Kabul or the rise of Kabul, uh, because it depends more on our understanding of, and from where we're looking into it. So the fall of Kabul into the hands of Taliban apparently ended the long 20 years American war on terror. In May 2018, surprisingly, the American Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstructions we call it SIGUR. It issued a report titled Stabilization, Lessons from the US Experience in Afghanistan. And that, that is where I was inspired for my title of the thesis. So this report highlighted that the US government greatly overestimated its ability in reforming Afghanistan and also their program of restabilizing and uh, restructuring Afghanistan was not properly tailored to the Afghan context. So therefore, in the light of what we know, uh, we see that Afghanistan is having complete chaos, political and social and economic. Its economic institutions are largely run by the NGOs, while the social structure is rendered obsolete. We see the presence of international advisors and even the advisors have advisors. So to put it simply, Kabul is full of spies, 
but they call themselves advisors. NGOs also the, now one thing is particularly interesting for me as well, and I hope you understand Arundhati Rai when she's saying in help of uh, help that hinders. So she's saying that NGOs alter the public psyche. They turn people into dependent victims and blunt political resistance. They have become the arbitrators, the interpreters, the facilitators, and everything they are. The greater the devastation caused by neoliberalism, the greater the outbreaks of NGO. And this is a very common phenomenon in uh, not only in Afghanistan, but in other countries after um, we can think about the refugees of uh, Myanmar coming into Bangladesh, and then there are the bloomings of NGOs in Bangladesh as well. So yes, it happens all the time, no matter where. Now, I would like to draw your attention to the economic aspects of the long war that America lost and was very shameful for the Americans. So last year, President Ashraf Ghani of Afghanistan said 90% of the population of Afghanistan was living on less than two percent two dollar a day which roughly equates to bdt 170. now this is the case with the people in afghanistan but on the other hand there are many multi-millionaires in afghanistan over the period of this war because um, the money that came from america and other coalition governments of course went into the wrong hands so Taliban's real estate business has bloomed, the NGO has bloomed, and the international advisors of those NGOs have made Kabul their temporary homes, whereas the local populations have become third class citizens. Now, this is almost similar to what the Wall Street people say in where there is a blood on the street by property. And that is exactly what the Taliban are doing. Now, I'm coming back to my own understanding. Lessons learned in the light of what we know. As we can see, whereas Khaled Husseini draws a human face of Afghanistan in his re recent writings, for example, uh, in the Kite Runner or Thousand Splendid Psalms, Yahida Rahman portrays Afghanistan from a very political and mostly personal experience as faced by the protagonist, Zafar. The novel portrays a very grim political picture of Afghanistan where the people seems terrorized, brutalized, and mined by the sheer presence of war. In the backdrop, the country is torn apart by the war and people are rendered poor and helpless. But surprisingly, on the other hand, land rovers, land cruisers, Pazeros, and monster Humvees, all these costly cars take the streets the Afghani, as we find in the novel, Afghan Development Aid and Reconstruction Institutions is an NGO run mostly by the Australian government. Um, that aid workers have become the policy makers, whereas the Afghan doctors and engineers become drivers for quick money because they earn much better uh, by driving than consulting patients. On the other hand, small kids have become service providers to the NGO workers in the hotels and where they live, basically. And Afghan women work for the white man during their pastimes and leisure. Now, US-led coalition attacked Afghanistan in October 2011, immediately after the attack in uh, the Twin Tower. But by March 20. Uh, 2002, the United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, which is called UNAMA, was well established in Kabul. Land cruisers were running into Kabul. US helicopters laden with UNAMA staff churned the dust and makeshift airfields in outlying districts, pulling pins and powering shorts. So, this is what suddenly happened in Afghanistan. So, a country which was basically under Taliban government that they were running the country to some extent uh, positively and of course there are negative aspects to it but immediately after the coalition government attacked afghanistan the scenario changed and people were hard so uh, you have two more minutes i have two more minutes, minutes. okay two more minutes. okay, okay. Uh, thank you very much uh suhaif as we see in character an afghan professor of engineering has now turned into a driver Bureaucratic decisions are taken by the youngsters who are not even able to manage themselves. The government departments are run by the foreigners. Suleiman and apparently political Afghans says Afghanistan doesn't have the oil of the Khazars, 
this affords the American war in Iraq as well. So we are not ready to prostitute our women like the Thais. Unlike the Westerners, ours is not a spiritual poverty, but a material one, which gives us a positivity that one day Afghanistan might probably change. So in Afghanistan, life can only be understood backwards historically, but trouble is that it has to be lived afterwards. So coming back to the summary, Afghanistan is all about uncertainty, hypocrisy, and spying now. As we can see, one of the characters says, who knows what to expect in this country? So barely two days after, the, after landing in Kabul, uh, our Zafar has already faced hypocrisy and the stain of blood. Um, So it is then probable that the Afghan people would likely to change things for the better. It is here that our protagonist Zafar is offered to replace the leadership at Afdari, the NGO. So Suleiman says a change is what we need here and they will support it, their Taliban leaders. Now, one thing about the title of the novel is in the light of what we know that uh, we cannot understand anything in particular because we have a very cataract vision. Nothing is very uh, certain. So uh, it also brings in to the narrative of the novel, uh, as one monarch says, has it occurred to you that the lust for certainty is a sin. So it, it blurs our vision and it uh, blocks our vision from further understanding of the text. So the whole novel brings us to a partial or complete understanding of what is going on, like Gorel's incompleteness theorem as described in the book. So the novel does not clear our cataract vision about Afghanistan, but it rather int intensified our con confusion. So I'll skip a few pages uh, and then come to this. The novel's emphasis on the absence of certainty or our ability to prove what is true is to supply narrative texture. It allows the two interlocutors to use science to debunk ignorance, to counter the arguments of false dichotomies, and beyond that to preserve an essential sense of mystery in the tale we are being told. So in Khaled Hussein's understanding of Afghanistan after the fall of Kabul, he says for more than 20 years, the Taliban has systematically terrorized, brutalized, mined and murdered its own people. So that's what comes up from the novel as a whole. Uh, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Zaidul Islam for your detailed presentation. And uh, now, um, uh, just just a moment. Um, can, I, can I stop sharing, Mr. Zahid? Okay, thank you. Uh, and now it brings us to our uh, last presenter. Um, uh, Ms. Um, uh, Nishat Atiya, uh, she is affiliated with the University uh, of Liberal Arts, Bangladesh. And uh, the title of her presentation is The Garden of Hamza's Father, Now and Then, Afghanistan's uh, Quiet uh, Resistance in a Fourth of Nine Towers. Uh, Ms. Atiya? Yes, Assalamu alaikum, sir. Can you hear me? Uh, uh, yes, uh, you are audible. Yes. All right. Thank so you. I would like to share my screen. Yeah, sure, go on. So I hope it's visible. Uh, yes. It's visible? Uh, yes. All right. All right. Thank you very much, sir. I, I hope I can start now. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. All right. So uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us here today. So I'm Nisha Atiya, and I will be talking about um, the Garden of Hamza's father, now and then, as uh, depicted in Afghanistan's resistance, quiet resistance in the autobiography titled A uh, Fort of Nine Towers. All right. So uh, Kai Sakbar Omar's uh, coming of age memoir, A Fort of Nine Towers, attracted international readership after its publication in 2014, primarily because of its poetic, poignant take on an adolescent's first-hand experience of a 1991 Afghanistan. The much familiar occidental projection of the country as a war-torn global terror hub is not its subject matter, rather the life of a local boy growing up with his family and hundreds of other regular children who laughed together, read poetry, shared stories, prayed devoutly, and hoped for a better future 
in the spacious idyllic garden filled compounds of Kabo. And uh, through Omar's Bildung's romantic narrative, uh, though at times it can be somewhat biased and naive, uh, the book aims to identify the turbulent transition Afghanistan itself was going through after the departure of the USSR troops, the subsequent entries of the Mujahideen and later on the Taliban, followed by a post 9-11 American occupation, followed by a post 9-11 American occupation. Nevertheless, the Afghan civilians adopted some quiet modes of communal resistance as can be identified in the autobiography. Uh, for instance, surviving arbitrary imprisonments, taking a decisive nostalgic refuge in the pre-war memories, staying back in the Afghan strongholds, uh, and then embodying a childlike spirit that pursues the simple beauties of country life. So inspired by the works of Khalid Husseini, uh, a fort of nine towers further exerts the importance of imagination and nostalgia as two of the most powerful factors of an, of an effective resistance in the face of bloodshed and violence. All right. So how was uh, Afghanistan, as says the very title of the presentation? Um, and the answer would be, according to the author's uh, childhood memories, and that is no less than an Arcadia. In his own words, a beautiful garden. So we get to see, for instance, uh, Omar, uh, the protagonist, he is the writer as well. So we get to see, for instance, his grandfather, who's a solitary man of nature. He loves to keep quiet and read, for example, Afghanistan in the course of history written by Mir Ghulam Muhammad Gober, where pre-war Afghan histories enumerate the former glories of the country. The grandfather's decided refuge in the eventful past of Afghanistan as a pastime activity further captures the pride this particular family took in Afghanistan's local history, describing a lifestyle that was once self-complacent in an admirable way. Secondly, a collective nostalgia of the pre-war memories of life seems to uh, you know, permeate the entire autobiography as the fond memories of family life, like telling stories, reciting poetry, selling carpets, which was the family business, and arranging marriages, you know, all these seem to save their lives and motivate each other to keep pushing themselves till light can be seen at the end of the tunnel. It is precisely this memory of flying kites together, for instance, uh, that saves Omar and his family during an underground combat in the city as the leader of the tunnel diggers, uh, the leader of the tunnel diggers proves to be none other than their old gardener's assistant a hardworking teenager and Omar's partner in kite fighting. And upon finding his old employer's son and grandson in captivity, he orders their immediate release. So yes, memory plays a big role. Thirdly, the repeated suggestions made by Omar himself as each Afghan household as separate little gardens that no one is allowed to enter without permission further reinforces the image of the country as a little collection of secure private worlds, an open-hearted, hospitable community of generous middle-class people, one minute laughing and the next minute shouting, and always loyal to their kind. And then, uh, as for the uh, uh, you know, fourth point, you can see, it, it's the generosity. It's the generosity among the common Afghans that makes it clear, furthermore, that uh, when we get to see how after abandoning their grandfather's large house that had Macintosh apple trees all around in Kabul, the family finds sanctuary with Haji Noor Sher, a family friend and partner in the carpet business and later with the Kuchi nomads. But then again, generosity and the kindness of strangers prevails. And then championing tradition and uh, domestic heritage seems to be another element of Omar's presentation of an Edenic Afghanistan, where the family tradition of reading Rumi, you know, then Shams Tabrizi, Hafiz, Saadi, Omar Khayyam, and then enjoying a little bit of afternoon tea, inviting friends over to discuss political affairs, saying prayers in congregations, they were a must. And altogether, these factors engendered a strong communal feeling of mutual understanding and security. And even decades later, the Afghan nomads, 
are suggested to nurture the same culture, customs, family values, and their code of Pashtun Wali, which are respect, honor, and hospitality, which, however, all maintain with one change of contact, and that is that uh, conduct, and that is that they cannot travel as much as they used to uh, uh, with mines planted all over Afghanistan. And the very ancient wisdom that, you know, Kalai Nobaroja embodied, the fort of the nine towers, that echoes the title of the memoir and also the place where the family took temporary refuge for a while, again suggests the sense of safety that tradition was to Omar and his family. And finally, uh, uh, in Omar's own interpretation, upon the snake's invasion of the country from the outside, namely those of the USSR and the US, the memoir serves as a cautionary tale that shows what awaits a society which allows itself to be divided, causing the very poignant biography itself to traverse from Kabul to Kalai Nabroja, across the Sniper Mountain to Doshi, to Bamiyan, to Kunduz, to Mazari Sharif, and back. Risking life in the face of bullets, rockets, missiles, dogs, mines, and Janus faced local chip takes. Janus faced uh, local chip takes. And then moving on to the, uh, uh, you know, the actually the focus of the presentation itself, the resistance. How does the resistance then take place in opposition to the, uh, uh, to ultimately what happens to the garden upon the snake's entry? So ultimately the silent yet active resistance of Afghan civilians against the increasing socio-political restless in the restlessness in the country makes itself clear through several occasions and characters in the memoir. The first being Omar's family's complete rejection of politics as it is. Omar's father and grandfather, for instance, they proved hopeful at first about Afghanistan's political scenario, but the liberation from the Soviet Union was short-lived as soon as after that, fighting breaks out across the country. It was when a forest catches fire, Omar writes. He says, both the dry and the wet burn. So the family then retreats to their basement after the onslaught of rockets and snipers uh, forced them to abandon their home altogether. But ultimately, the resistance prevails. After that, you can see Omar's consideration of the Mujahideen, the second factor of my analysis, Omar's consideration of the Mujahideen as a group of which existence was essentialized by the USSR becomes clear when he admits how originally it was rather the concerted effort of the shuras or local authorities of rural Afghanistan against the military imposition of the Soviet Union that had the locals believe in the beginning of a new hopeful chapter in, chapter in Afghan history. Ms. Nisha, but the, yes. you have two more minutes. Thank you, sir. All right. Uh, but the disillusionment of it all was not too late to follow as the in-group factions and eventual rise of the opportunists obliterated whatever distinction there was left between what was true and what seemed to be true. For instance, we see how at one point when Omar's house was being robbed in Kabul, uh, the armed man called their leader as the commander essentially invoking a suggestion of fear in the audience while implying that indeed they were a powerful sect of the Mujahideen. But soon we know from Omar's narrative in his voice, he says, suddenly I understood that these guys were just ordinary thieves who had joined one of the factions. They were not the Mujahideen who defend their country and faith against the invaders and heretics. So this is the sort of politically convoluted time we are talking about where truths and rumors seemed to be the same sides of the coin. And it is this calm and collected response of this commons, which however intimidated the very man who held weapons in their hands. For instance, you, get, you can see from the quotation here that when Omar's grandfather was saying his prayers, these armed robbers, they invade the house, but then again, he refuses to get up. And he just frankly says, you know, after finishing his prayer, he says, if you think I will be scared by your loud voice, well, you're stupid. And um, after that, uh, very briefly, I will uh, uh, you know, go over how the resistance continues on the part of the civilians, the civil, uh, 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 the Afghan civilians. So you can also see a sort of uh, tendency uh, in Omar to refuse 
the global biased uh, media coverage that was going on regarding Afghanistan and the number of its dead civilians or the actual scenario of the overall damage the country was experiencing due to the violent factions among in-house groups like the Hazaras and the Panjshiris, consequently leading to the final stages of the American occupation of Afghanistan. He was so angry against this biased coverage, Omar actually wants to break uh, radio into two, but he cannot do that because his family cannot afford an expensive equipment like that later in the middle of the war. And uh, coming to my last point, you can see and the power of uh, communal imagination and the benignity of, of children's logic also happens to actually help the family survive all these traumas. You know, it becomes clear when you see that uh, at times this journey becomes less of a flight of terror than a grand tour of the country's heritage. You know, Omar learns to love the countryside and he also learns to love the carpet weavers, which is the very tradition of his family. And all in all, to conclude my argument, uh, in conclusion, we can say that much like the 100 year old fort, Kalai Nogoroja, which strongly held onto a last surviving tower with its eight other pillars rendered invisible, the Afghan lives in the memoir quietly wait for the, waited for the beginning of a new dawn by seeking beauty, stories, memories, adventures, and communal feelings. A world away of the imposed bloodshed and violence. So this is the work cited page and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you stop sharing your screen? Yep. Yes, uh, I'll be playing. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thanks for your uh, thought provoking uh, presentation. I mean, all of our presenters have presenting something new and fresh, their ideas, uh, especially uh, the way they have analyzed the uh, situation on the ground from different perspective with di utilizing different analytical, uh, wide ranging analytical uh, lenses. It's just something uh, fascinating. Uh, all right, now I'm going to open the floor for uh, our audience. If you have any question, um, then at the plenary, uh, yes sir, <laughs> we're coming back. All right, uh, uh, if you have any question, uh, quickly just ask. We have to cut it short a little bit. Uh, so that we can join the plenary. Uh, yes, floor is open to everyone if you have any question. So uh, I, uh, with that, I think we don't have uh, any, any uh, questions uh, here from our audience. I want to thank you all, our presenters, Kazi Yarko Rahman, Dr. Sanjay Malik, uh, Muhammad Zahidul Islam, and uh, uh, our um, uh, Ms. Nishat as well, so uh, for your presentation and thank you. So officially I'm going to wrap it up. Thank you.